Uh, the webinar series, as I mentioned, uh, is in partnership with JICEA and the Strategic Energy Security Group, uh, headed by Elijah Hotkiss. Here is a overview of the perspectives from the field, uh, that, and we've been featuring a range of expert discussions. You see the key topics. Uh, we started out around housing solutions. We looked at demographic projections and energy planning. We even had Dr. Uh, Suma look at uh, legal frameworks. And today, uh, Dr. Brian Ragsdale is going to look at public mental health. And then next week, we'll end with public health challenges in climate displaced populations. Um, and then we are honored to host these experts. Uh, and thought leaders, and basically we want the webinars to provide novel insights and serve as a launching point for new projects and partnerships investigating in this space. Next slide, please. So that brings us to today's presentation. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Brian Ragsdale. His presentation is entitled Addressing Mental Health Challenges for Climate Displaced Populations. Dr. Ragsdale is a, a, a clinical psychologist. Can we mute? Thank you. A clinical psychologist uh, in Illinois and New Hampshire, an adjunct uh, psychology professor, and a SIPAC certified telehealth psychotherapist. Dr. Ragsdale has been in the psychology field for over 30 years and has held various leadership roles in research teaching psychology associations, including various educational environments. As a health disparity scholar, he examines how systems impact well-being and mental health. Dr. Ragsdale has been, a, has been recognized as a health disparity scholar by the National Minority Health and Health Institute. In his current role as CEO for Visionary Scientist Research Group, his organization conducts research that measures behavioral change processes and examines systemic factors that impact health and social disparities. Dr. Ragsdale has extensive experience in conceptualizing and implementing systemic change processes using empirically based psychotherapy models and blending the best ideas from traditional academic environments with technological advances that support adult learning. Dr. Ragsdale holds a master and doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Rhode Island. And now that I have finished uh, presenting those slides, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Ragsdale. Dr. Ragsdale. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas, for your introduction, and I am happy to be here today. Today we're talking about addressing mental health challenges for client space displaced populations. And here's a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. One is I'm looking at how climate-induced uh, um, populations who are displaced, how it uproots families and communities. So the central focus of my conversation with you today is thinking about the ways that families and communities are impacted by systems. And we're going to explore the impact of mental health and also some well-being. And throughout my presentation, you'll see that um, this is my artwork here. I'm an artist. I've been an artist for a long time, so I thought I would also share some of my artwork with all of you. Uh, so a couple of learning objectives for today. So we're going to talk about the global impact on energy systems and the impact on well-being. We're going to take a, a, a sort of a macro view of trauma, depression, and anxiety. And I'll talk about some of my counseling and clinical experiences with folks who are traumatized and depressed and anxious. And then we're going to talk about some coping strategies and then briefly talk about some um, major systems and the historical impacts on uh, large groups of people. Uh, I, I will note that this uh, content is solely for educational purposes. So anything I say should not be taken as a replacement for medical, clinical, professional advice or diagnosis or even uh, any type of behavioral interventions. Okay. So my background, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for sharing some of my background. I thought it would be helpful to kind of step us through how I sort of became a, a clinical psychologist. So I'm licensed in the state of Illinois, 
have been for 17 years. I'm also a licensed as a clinical psychologist in New Hampshire. I am an adjunct psychology professor, adjunct, um, adjunct, not adjunct, <laughs> adjunct. And I've, I've taught at like six or seven different universities. I'm a PsychPAC certified telehealth psychotherapist, which is essentially I'm able to see people uh, online in, a, in a, this sort of this interactive uh, environment for psychotherapy. Uh, I'm a health disparity scholar, and I'll talk a little bit more about that journey of how and why I became a health disparity scholar. So I have over 20 years of teaching in the psychology and graduate and undergraduate levels. I'm published in uh, our leading journals in psychology, the American Psychologist. You'll, you'll be able to see my 2006 article where I talk about my experience um, tr trying to get my degree in child development and journal in youth and adolescence. A lot of my work has been looking at identity and how it is across uh, uh, the creation or, so, or the, our ability to sustain our identities, how that forms in children, adolescents, and then also how our identities are impacted as adults. And then this is my some of our uh, co-author work and a number of readers that we've had. So here I'm going to talk a little bit, just uh, a little bit high level about how how I became a psychologist and psychotherapist. And I thought I would take you through my journey, my actual uh, learning and teaching journey. Um, and uh, hopefully that'll give you some insight of how I sort of think about people. So I first started out in psychodynamic and psychodynamic is really this, this idea that there are uh, unconscious, subconscious ways that people are impacted uh, through their uh, family relationships, through their uh, through their interactions with different systems and so forth, and uh, what that means to them. Also, I was looking at family systems work. In other words, the ways that uh, caregivers, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, aunts, influence and shape how we develop ourselves, essentially, how we become who we are. And then uh, in terms of psychotherapy, uh, I'm an eclectic therapist, but I look at cognitive behavioral techniques. We know that, for example, the way that you think and the way that you feel uh, also then impact how you behave. So those are the sort of the ABCs of thinking about cognitive behavioral uh, techniques. And as a psychologist, I've been uh, fortunate to, to work in, in virtually every setting for a psychologist. So I've worked in medical settings, both urban in Chicago, for example, and even rural here. And I did some training in at the Vermont uh, VA Medical Center here. I also have worked in counseling centers, both public and private. That's a typo, sorry. So I've worked in uh, counseling centers for a state university, and I've also did some training at Dartmouth, uh, which is a, a private uh, liberal arts college. I've also worked in social service agencies and community mental health. So I've had this really wide background seeing lots of different types of people across lots of different uh, behavioral health and healthcare settings. The main focus of my work has been with veterans with PTSD. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as uh, we'll talk about trauma and uh, depression, anxiety. I've also done a significant amount of um, work in, in Chicago thinking about uh, Black communities and communities of color and how uh, we as a community respond to intercommunal violence. Um, and uh, also in my private practice work, uh, which I also currently do, I have a small private practice now, about 10 people a week I see, we talk about stress, trauma, and adjusting to work issues. And then finally, uh, family issues and uh, children and adolescents. I do testing and evaluation um, here in the uh, local school district with uh, special education uh, children. Uh, so I do cognitive uh, cognitive uh, assessment. And uh, and my latest work is uh, focusing on women's health issues. So I work with a uh, with a Maven Clinic doing some uh, psychotherapy with my PSYPAC licensure around women's health issues. All of these experiences that I've had throughout my 20 to 30 plus years 
of being in the field of psychology, I was faced with this uh, these systemic biases, and I n noticed that there were these health disparities. So you would look at groups of populations, and for example, uh, whites would would be higher on this level, and, and African Americans would be lower. So there were the disparities in all these different ways that we were thinking about uh, behavioral health or health and so forth. So um, I got some early career support um, from the National Minority Health and Health Institute. Uh, it was essentially a, a loan repayment program, but um, it helped me to really focus in on uh, these disparities and how systems influence. So one of the one of the, the, the major th ways that I think about mental health is in this slide here. This is the foundational way that I think about well-being. I think about well-being as being connected to quality relationships. And by this, I mean not necessarily having tons and tons of people in your life, but actually looking at quality of those relationships, the relationship between partners, the relationships between teachers and students, the relationship between uh, bosses and their employees, uh, the, the idea or the, the concept that the well-being is connected to these relationships is a central element in thinking about well-being and mental health. And within this uh, relational connection model that I'm trying to draw here is the importance of trust, uh, the feeling of that you belong in that group or you belong in that system, and then feeling respected. This feeling of uh, being respected is very, very important for people to feel uh, healthy and to feel well. And so trusting, belonging, and feeling respected, these are all essential sort of foundational elements for promoting well-being. So here's a quick little uh, thing for us, for you to think about. So in 2019, how many people do you think in the world have a mental disorder? You don't need to put this in the chat room, but just sort of go through this list and kind of think, what would your answer be? So in 2019, they surveyed how many people in the world have a mental disorder. And the, the answer uh, it was surprising to me, and I, and I think it might be surprising to you as well. And that answer is one in eight. So we have a, roughly around a billion people across the world who have some form of mental disorder. And, uh, and this is from the World Health Organization. So this is a lot of people who are struggling and need support and help. And the next slide is going to talk, I'm gonna to talk to you about how across mental disorders or well-being, we have to think about it in terms of a continuum. So here, for example, if I was talking about a person who's depressed, I would be thinking about, is it mild depression? Is it moderate depression? Is it severe depression? And we know, for example, that there are certain uh, environmental events that happen that then push people across this continuum. But that's the first way that I think about uh, well-being or mental health is when someone comes into my practice or my office, I'm thinking if they're depressed, are they mild, are they moderate, severe? And then the next thing uh, I want to, you to remember is that there's a concept that we call comorbid. So th those uh, mental disorders that overlap with each other. So we know, for example, that people who are depressed, and we'll talk about what depression is in a minute, are also very anxious. So there's an overlap between being depressed and anxious. So if I'm seeing someone who is uh, anxious, they are more than likely going to be also de de depressed. So in these next three slides, I'm going to talk about uh, trauma, uh, depression, anxiety, some definitions that I think are helpful for us thinking about the ways in which uh, climate ref refugees can be impacted by these uh, shocking events. 
So trauma is, uh, I think of trauma as this emotional response to a, this terrible, shocking event. And you can see here in the definition that natural disaster is also a part of that. So a natural disaster of some sort can then create this emotional response in people. And the first, uh, the first way is that many people who are traumatized or experience these negative events, there's shock and denial. So when people have these terrible things happen, the first thing is how they talk about how shocked they were that it happened. And then they, this is this way of trying to deny that this was as bad as it, as it possibly was. And then of course, there's some longer term reactions. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but there are longer term effects of people who are trauma and um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder is one of those ways. Uh, depression, uh, we are all, many of us are familiar with depression because it's so prevalent. Um, I don't know the, the, exact, the, the, the exact number, but it's like one in five or one in four. And we know that sometimes there are gender differences in the way that people are depressed. So it's a feeling sad, feeling hopeless, uh, losing this interest in uh, activities. I'm also uh, asking about sleep. Um, and asking about uh, if the person is moving or sitting still. Uh, and then there's this also aspect of feeling worthless, this feeling of feeling uh, guilty or feeling like that the person's hopeless. And then there's also suicidal ideation. So depression is a debilitating for people, particularly on the severe level, uh, the moderate level as well. And uh, as we talked about earlier, this can also be mild forms of de depression. And then the final, uh, the, the next one is uh, anxiety. Now, anxiety is an emotion uh, that can be characterized by this uh, sort of constant worrying about everything. And it's a little different than fear. Fear is uh, more short term, but anxiety is more of a global feeling that something something's bad is going to happen or you're worried. And next, I want to then uh, take our thinking about trauma, depression, anxiety. And I, I want to try to help you to think about how uh, climate refugees who are moving in groups. So when there is a major uh, event, a heating event or uh, uh, tornadoes or any natural event, then when people are displaced, they are moving in groups. They are moving in these clusters. And so this is a very important uh, way for us to, to conceptualize what happens, that people are in large groups moving and displaced. And we know that if you move from one culture to another culture, there are some psychological tasks. One of those psychological tasks is to integrate and to synthesize into that new culture. And we can we can commonly see this even in, in the United States, for example, the different cultural ways that different towns have their different cultures. And likewise, the group who's already there, they also have to adapt their system. So there's this interchange between these uh, displaced cultural groups and cultural groups. So I wanted us to, to think about this dynamic process. So we know that when there's climate change, uh, there is a displacement, and we talked uh, uh, we talked about this here today. I also want to remind us that these uh, displacements are also connected to uh, other crises. So, for example, um, climate change and displacements can threaten human rights. Uh, it can also increase uh, poverty levels and. Uh, people losing people during the crisis. And so that means they're mourning and grief and they constrain the relationships between communities. So you have this group of people, families, uh, communities who are displaced and trying to uh, adjust to this environment to sort of uh, to change that's happening. And then you also have people dealing with these human rights, these political poverty issues. So you're dealing with thinking about these multiple crises that are happening to people that overlap. And this is the my slide on wellness. And so now what I'm doing for the remainder of my conversation with you today, and I thank you for listening so intently, 
is I'm going to talk about wellness. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how people uh, become, how people maintain their wellness. And so I look at this list, as you'll see, and I try to work on all of these. Of course, I'm not able to work on all of them at once, but these are some of the domains of well-being. One is this inner, this inner peace. Uh, people having purpose and direction is so important. Um, uh, this connection community, which we talked about, of course, safety, food, and shelter. Um, I also think this ability to, to dream and to have hope is an important aspect for people to feel well, to feel like there is a positive something happening in their lives that they can look forward to. And I also think uh, well-being is uh, defined by uh, the ability to help others around you. So you'll see a lot of people who are in traumatic events helping each other. So that's an important part of well-being. And then I think the freedom from uh, from personal and communal violence is, uh, is uh, also quite important. And here in this list are some of the coping strategies. And um, I have about uh, 12 minutes left or so. So I kind of want to step through all, all of these with you and give you some brief reasons why I think that these are good and helpful coping strategies. One is uh, the first is meditation and relaxation. So one of the tools that I use in my counseling work is to, to help people to breathe. And uh, we, we do some breathing together. And breathing is such an important way because it helps us to recenter ourselves. It gives our body times to catch up. And it also helps us to be connected to the present. So meditation and relaxation is a very helpful, almost like a way of just sort of clearing out this all the, the noise that comes in. Of course, we know about um, the, the 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 detriment of alcohol and tobacco that these are um, these are chemicals that then influence our psychological and biological processes and this is a a well known fact. The next is keeping informed. Uh, people are always sort of uh, when you're in this uh, traumatic event or displacement, you're you're trying to get information about housing or you know, where can you get resources? So keeping informed is another uh, coping strategy. Um, the next is the limiting exposure to TV and social media. Uh, we know, that, for example, both in television and social media, there tends to be this loop of trauma, sort of videos and messages that are that are continuing to go back in loop. So I always suggest to my clients, if you know, if you don't have to look at it, if you look at it once, then just limit yourself at that point, because the rest is just going to be a trigger event for you. Uh, staying connected to friends and family is so important to, to have a place uh, where you can laugh and share and sort of uh, talk to those who have a history with you. This is uh, this is an important way that we our memory is sustained through our connections with our friends and families. And then local health resources. Um, and we all know in different communities, there are different places where people go to get help and around the health. And so knowing what those resources are, are very helpful. And the next is uh, good days and bad days. And we know that uh, healing from uh, tra trauma, that there are going to be these good days and these bad days. So it's not a linear progression where you just start feeling better and you feel better and better. You feel better then you don't feel better, and then you feel better again. And hopefully through all this process, you're starting to feel better and better more, but there's an expectation that you're going to have bad days. And then of course, exercise and rest, the getting the body to move is an important way to dislodge, I think some of those ways in which the body remembers. And this is why uh, doing yoga, doing some form of exercise, I think helps to dislodge some of those negative, uh, those negative bad things that the that the the, the body re remembers. And rest is also uh, extremely important. So when I first went to graduate school, 
back in 1995 when we started uh, my graduate programs, we we didn't focus enough on the restorative values of sleep and rest. So I'm always now in my initial work with clients asking them about how many hours do they sleep? Um, are they able to sleep through the through the night, for example? So sleep becomes a sort of a, a way that the body resets itself. So um, people who are um, dealing with trauma are often having nightmares and their sleep is disruptive. So uh, trying to help people sleep is uh, quite important. Um, and um, our next slide is, uh, so the question that I'm going to sort of leave you with is, is um, now that we've talked, you know, uh, on a high level about these effects that a climate crisis can have and these sort of complexities that that people can experience from from tra trauma, depression, anxiety, and displacement. Um, and I touched on some of those behavioral and psychological aspects. I was curious to know how will you as researchers at NREL take this interdisciplinary approach and then how would you guide your energy system projections based on what you learned today? 